here we are on March 12, 2017, in the Arrastradero main campus of Palo Alto University. I'm delighted to be here with you all tonight. We wanted to provide an opportunity for the broadest possible students, faculty, trustees, alums, wherever people might be, to be able to participate in our first Zoom town hall. So that's why we're coming to you live from, from the main campus, but you are wherever you are in the world. You might be in China or Finland or, or Palo Alto. We're not sure, but we're delighted that you're here and we're eager to have this time to talk with you. So, um, one of the things that we're trying to accomplish in my presidency, which is now eight months into the presidency, is to create a sense of community in, uh, at Palo Alto University in a way that is challenging because of how we are dispersed ge geographically. So this is one of the things we're trying, and we'd be very, very, I'll be very open for your feedback about how this works for you. So please, after this is completed, let me know how uh, you felt about the town hall and ideas you may have. In case you want to see what the campus looks like right now, uh, since you aren't able to be here, this is a view taken from outside on the on the top level uh, in the uh, Friday evening. So it's not quite this evening, but it's the same time period. So we wanted to give you a sense of the beautiful campus here so that you remember what a beautiful place we are privileged to be in. So I'm excited to talk to you tonight to share my thoughts and reflections on my first eight months at PAU. I've had the wonderful opportunity to meet many of you, I've had lots of one-on-one -on -one meetings with faculty, with students, with board of trustee members, with community members, and with alums. I've especially enjoyed the PAU Sunday suppers at my home. Uh, over 70 people have joined me for, for dinner. Uh, down in uh, Midtown Palo Alto for some hopefully good food and definitely good conversation. Uh, we, we're using those opportunities to find out what brought people to PAU, what their interests and, and uh, opportunities are that they've had since they've been here. Um, so if you've not had the chance to join us, no worries. We're going to go ahead and continue the Sunday suppers through next year. So there'll be lots more opportunities. In our time together tonight, we're going to do three things. First, we'll spend some time talking about a topic that's very, very important to, to me, and that is mentoring, um, and mentoring to your success at Palo Alto University. Then I'll share with you what I've been doing uh, since becoming president, my reflections on the strengths and opportunities that we have at PAU, and my ideas for, for moving us forward. And finally, I'm hoping to have the time to respond to as many of your questions as possible in our time together. I'm told that if you uh, type in your questions into the Q&A box on the Zoom um, uh, toolbar, that we will be able to see your questions here, and I will do my best to try to get to those uh, as many as, as we can in the time that we have. Yesterday, or this earlier this week, Supreme Court Justice Sonia Sotomayor was at Stanford right down the street. Her words resonated with me uh, about the importance of, she spoke so eloquently about the importance of education, of curiosity, and of charity, the way that we approach each other in the world. So when someone asked her about the current political divide in the United States, and I've spoken to many of you, I know many of you have concerns that have arisen in your own lives or in those that you, that you know or your families, she said, it's important to respect and understand people's motivations and where they're coming from. If it's a person of goodwill talking to you, there's something in that they're saying to you about their views, their needs, what's worrisome to them that has justification. I think what I want us to say at PAU is that we take our commitment to multicultural competency, to the values of multiculturalism, our respect for humanity, and our efforts to improve lives, we take those commitments seriously, in a principled way. And we need to ensure that all members of our community feel supported, feel heard, feel that they belong to a caring and welp welcoming university. So with that, I would like to move us toward the next phase of the uh, evening. One of the reasons I was drawn to Palo Alto University was because of its strong commitment to student success. Let me share a little bit of that with you. In our two doctoral programs, this just in the last month, our overall APA accredited internship match rate is over 95%. Uh, this is remarkable 
a, a statement about the quality of the training that our students are receiving and the amazing commitment of our faculty and administrators to support them. So I want to congratulate all of our students. Our master's program in counseling has just received eight years, the maximum it could possibly receive, accreditation from the Council for Accreditation of Counseling and Related Education programs. This is really important to our students and it really sets us on a path to have the top master's program in counseling in the country. And for our amazing undergraduates, a two-year graduation rate for our undergraduate psych majors of over 80%. These are, just, these are just but a few of the numbers that we could look at to show that our students are actually doing incredibly well here at PAU. Such success, of course, hinges on many things. Uh, great faculty, resources, effective classroom and practicum instruction, meaningful experiences in the community. And while we continue to work on improving all of those areas, in my opinion, mentoring is the crucial linchpin to overall success for most of our students. So tonight, let me just tell you a little what, what one recent Gallup poll found. In 2015 Gallup poll, 30,000 uh, graduates were polled. And the, the single most important thing that doubled their uh, decision to say that their education was worth the cost, the single most important thing, were statements relating to mentoring their professor cared about them. They had a mentor who encouraged them. They had at least one professor who made them excited about learning. Good mentoring matters. And I've asked three members of the PAU community to join me this evening to discuss the value of mentoring from their perspectives. Professor Will Snow, who leads our master's program. Thank you, Professor Snow. Professor Robert Wickham, who runs an active research lab and teaches and mentors throughout our PAU programs, and Charlotte Beard, a fourth year doctoral student, who came into my office last fall and spoke eloquently about how important mentoring has been to her. So I'd like to open up the discussion about mentoring by asking each of you to say a few words about mentoring and the value of mentoring uh, from your perspective. Uh, why is it so important? Why are we taking the time to talk about it? Uh, let's start with, with you, Will. So first of all, um, I'm so excited to be here. Um, I never thought about mentoring until I, I looked, when I began thinking about over the years. I'm only here um, because of some great mentors. My dad went to the sixth grade. I was the first person, he was a farm kid, first person to go to college. But I remember certain people, uh, Dr. Kathy Breyer, Pacific University, uh, Luane Gilchrist, University of Washington, and then a couple of my um, other other mentors I've had over the years, they're the reason I came. Kathy Breyer looked at me and she said, hey, you ought to go for your master's, you ought to go for your doctorate. And so she was somebody who uh, worked with me. Uh, Luane Gilchrist, um, University of Washington, um, taught me everything I know about publishing and research. These are people who are invested in me. And looking over the years, I recognize that good mentors help me to move on and to excel. I also had some bad mentors too, or bad, <laughs> bad examples who I realized who would really who would squash the dreams of others. So my goal in life is to be a mentor who helps um, helps people to achieve their dreams, to achieve their ideals, and I want to basically infuse that. And I see it as a, one of my jobs right now is that's one of my main jobs is I say to prepare the next generation of mental health professionals and counselors uh, in the country of Palo Alto. Great. About you, Robert. Um, well, so my background uh, is in social psychology, um, and in particular, um, relationship science. So um, for me, you know, the whole concept of mentoring is relationship driven, um, and so you know, that's the way I've kind of tried to approach it is to try to form a meaningful uh, relationship with students, and um, you know, the goal being overall to try to help them self determine, right? To um, to achieve what they will help them realize their goals and then help give them the tools. Um, and sometimes it's a two way street. Oftentimes it's a two way street. I end up um, learning just as much um, from students that I encounter and mentor um, as hopefully they learn something from me as well. Um, but the whole idea of, of you know, it being a, a student driven 
um, process, right? Um, where, you know, I can't tell you what to do. Um, ultimately, it comes from you, right, um, as the mentee. Um, and so, you know, to me, when, you know, when it works well, um, you know, really awesome things can happen. Um, but just as, as Dr. Snow pointed out, it doesn't always work well. So um, I think the real challenge kind of moving forward for a lot of folks and hopefully, you know, kind of being research focused, maybe it's the kind of thing that you know, warrants empirical investigation. Um, but really, let's, you know, try to figure out what, what makes a mentor relationship, mentor-mentee relationship um, really thrive. I like that. Build a research program right here. Charlotte, from your perspective. Um, I came for the meeting and came into your office because uh, I wanted to share what a great experience I've had at PAU, an unexpected experience. I actually started in Dr. Snow's program in the master's program and I had such a wonderful, rich experience. I was writing a paper about internet gaming and uh, the, the, how it got into the DSM-5 <laughs> and conditions for further study. and um, one great uh, teacher I had made some comments like, oh, this would be a dissertation idea. And it wasn't really something I had thought for myself to be writing a dissertation, um, but it was inspirational for me. And so I took all these ideas that I had and I put them in a, a spreadsheet and started uh, the doctoral program here at PAU a year later. And in applying for research groups, I was looking for professors who shared an interest, but it wasn't um, something that was really widespread or, or uh, matched many people's interests here. So I found my way to um, interview with a lot of great professors here, but Dr. Wickham um, said, well, these are really great ideas, and I don't exactly know everything about internet gaming disorder, but I know how to actualize an idea. And so my work here has really um, been, been uh, been greatly impacted by not only my work with Dr. Wickham and but also with other professors and it's taken those initial ideas I had in that very class in the master's <laughs> program and really expanded them into something different and unexpected in that now I know a lot more about statistical methods and my um, career path is different than I could have imagined in so many great ways and it's not only that I get to explore my own ideas but that I know now that these other things are possible. And so um, it's with great gratitude and surprise that I'm, I'm here, and I, I really appreciate the opportunity. Well, we're delighted to have you here. Um, thank you all very much for that. And Will, you've made the comment before that, uh, and Will is the, the winner of a national mentoring award just just this this semester in uh, in counseling. So you've got you've got he's got credibility here. But you've made the comment that advising is not mentoring. So. Can you talk a little bit about that? Yeah, because I think what happens is, you know, we create these sort of systems in place and we assign students a mentor. Uh, I'm not, sorry, and it, we, we assign them an advisee, they hand out the course descriptions and they maybe meet and give all the technical information. But when I see mentorship, it's really about not just the technical piece, because honestly, You've got the web now, right? We've got, you can, you know, we can send you emails, we can, you're on, you're, you can just, we can just send you information. But the thing about mentorship, it's more personal. Um, it, it's, it, it means that the mentor understands the student, understands their needs, what's happening with them, uh, listens to issues, helps them guide them. I mean, and doesn't make a lot of assumptions. You know, I, as I said, you know, my dad went to the sixth grade. Um, many first-time college students are here. Some of the real basic questions, people might be afraid to ask, right? And so just being able to have that relationship and talk with that. And sometimes students have issues, like we've had students with financial issues. We've had students with deaths in family. Mm -hmm. Things that would make some people just mm -hmm. stop, right? Mm -hmm. Or just, or maybe drop out. So mentorship has a lot of facets. But that relationship, and I talk about this as a trust relationship, is something that may not be your advisee, it may be a professor, it might be a senior student, it might be, a, um, could be somebody outside the university, it could be alumni. So I think we need somebody in our lives who can speak to us, not just about the professional aspects, but about the personal aspects to help us get going and to kind of achieve our dream. Because, you know, I can push, I can push on, on students my ideas, you know, in the same sense, you know, I can say, here's a great idea, Charlotte. But to realize the question is, what's Charlotte's idea, right? And what really do they need and what do they need help? So, 
So I think it's just very different. And I think if we, we always talk organic, it happens often, sometimes naturally. And so a lot of my, my best mentors are pure people who I just bumped into. But the most important thing was they took an interest, they stopped and listened to me. And most of them, it's interesting, I think the most important thing, most of them saw more in me than I did. Because by the way, I'm surprised I'm here, Charlotte. <laughs> you know, when I got my A degree, I said, "Wow, I've accomplished something, right?" Right. And, right, and, I, right. and so after my A degree, I I've gone beyond everything I ever thought I would do. I think it's interesting that many of us here, and many people I've spoken to over the years, who really value mentoring, um, like myself, or first generation college in their family. You know, I think that finding, you know, when I when I got to college, I didn't. I didn't know what to do. You know, I really, I, I didn't have a lot of background and uh, a professor, you know, just in that case, it was a professor, you know, just again, like Will said, saw something in me that I didn't see in myself. The other thing I want to mention is that it doesn't stop when you're a student. So I, you know, as you move up in your, in your career, whatever level you are, um, you know, I was telling the group earlier, I'm working on a, a a conference for next year for higher ed administrators, women in higher ed administration, to do to do mentoring of each other. So you know the need for mentoring goes on; it doesn't stop after you after you graduate. So it's it's something really important. Um, I wanted to ask Charlotte to follow up on you. You mentioned that you actually kind of changed your career trajectory based on your mentoring relationship. So can you say a little bit more about that? Because I think that's something. Especially at every level, I think you come in thinking you're, you're supposed to be able to write in your statement, right, your application statement, what you want to do, and that somehow that's what you're supposed to do. Mm -hmm. So talk a little bit about, about that. Absolutely. Definitely. Um, I think, uh, and a lot of students have had this uh, same experience, I think, from what I've, I've, I've heard, is that you come in thinking you're going to do one thing, and then every Every time you learn something new, suddenly all your ideas are thrown out the window and you're changed. But I think I was quite rigid. I was I, I was pretty certain when I came in, okay, I'm gonna study internet gaming disorder, I'm coming up with treatments for it, like this is absolutely what I want to do. And then um my first project with, with Robert was making a, a measure for internet gaming. Um and the measurement part of it and the stats part of it was just really infectious and really interesting. And I found myself um being exposed to these resources and measurement and statistics that I I wouldn't otherwise have found for sure. And so then I started getting involved in projects like the statistics uh consultation center and even getting involved in other people's groups who did um work with with Robert and maybe needed a student mm -hmm. and he thought, oh, okay, I, I can mentor you in that role too. I mean, speaking for you, but I think so as a statistics consultant, and now I think my career tra trajectory has changed, or at least the opportunities that I have have certainly broadened um, because I love doing um, consultation so much and I love stats and it was just a new passion that I was able to find that otherwise I wouldn't have considered. And I'm seeing that we have a question that has come in that actually I would love to throw out to the panel. And that is strategies for mentoring that might work better with online students. And maybe, Will, you know, since you're particularly in the counseling program, you use a lot of virtual classes. Um, might you have some thoughts about that? And thank you, Charlotte, for that wonderful. You know, for one thing is, uh, there's a distance issue. I see one comment about coming here more, and that's always a balance. On one hand, if you want to make this thing really accessible, I would love if people, I mean, there are some programs, people show up every quarter. That can be really expensive. You show up at least once, I think, for a week. We could include that. On another hand, um, it's funny. I have a lot of people I work with five miles away who do it by Zoom. So I think a lot of it was uh, simply time and availability. Zoom works well. Um, my problem is there is no one size fits all, but I think, you know, Zoom is not just for a class. I do lots of individuals, small group kind of mentoring and talking. Um, our faculty use it. So I think we need to take advantage for people at a distance with these technologies. We talk about taking the distance out of, you know, out of distance, distance learning. Um, but like even today, I mean, we can't, we're, we're watching your questions, but in a real personal way, um, I interview all of our students. So I think we can do this Zoom technology. And I think the biggest thing would be ask, I, I, I give my phone number to everybody. I probably at this university, 400 people have my cell phone. <laughs> 
But I don't get I many. I was the only one. But I don't. <laughs> but I don't get many phone calls, and rarely do I. Was people often feel they're inconvenienced. I said, mm-hmm. "Don't be surprised." People always said, "I'm sorry to bother you. Don't bother me. This is what we do." I would encourage you <laughs> to not be afraid to talk to the professor and say, because mm-hmm. oftentimes I'm doing horrible paperwork for, <laughs> for, for the president, you know, I'm doing all these statistics, oh, and so I'm, I'm, I'm wanting somebody to call me on the phone so I can, I can drop my paper and talk to a human being, right? So love relationship. Find the faculty who want to talk with you. And by the way, it may not be an hour, it may be 20 minutes, but just talk with people, connect. I think it's all here. Don't be afraid to ask. Right. And Dominic, you we can Zoom. Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> Excellent. So, um, Robert, I want to since you're a relationship scholar, you're 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 the you're, you have the substantive expertise here too. But what is the balance in your view between so given what Charlotte was describing, so she had an interest, but but you helped her find this other path. What's the balance between guiding a student toward a particular path, or helping the student identify their path? Like, how do you, how do you navigate that? Yeah, I mean, I think it, it's a fine line, right? Um, assuming there's some raw material there, right? Like <laughs> inkling of an idea or something, right? Spreadsheet. Uh, spreadsheet. <laughs> yeah, right. 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 Lots of ideas. Yeah, I mean, we'll still have a hope. Still have <laughs> yeah, yeah, right? Somewhere. Yeah. <laughs> but, you know, assuming there's some raw material there, which there almost always is, right? Mm-hmm. Like, the, the idea is that, that you, you, the last thing you want to do is be heavy-handed. Right. But at the same time, you know, this isn't going to end up <laughs> sounding like much, but at the same time, um, you don't want to let them just kind of be completely left up to their own devices. Yeah, right. Exactly. So, I mean, I think there, to some degree, there's kind of modeling that goes on. Right. Like um, and sometimes it can be anecdotal. Like, you know, I found myself in a similar kind of position and here's all the different ways I could have taken it. Right. Um, I could have gone this way with the idea um, and designed this kind of study and, and written it up this way and presented it this way. Or I could have done these other ways. Right. Let's talk about how that might map on schematically to what you are doing. Right. Like what do you you know, ultimately, let's keep in mind proximal and distal goals. Right. And make sure that they kind of line up. But, you know, being flexible about, you know, ultimately the data doesn't have to cooperate with you, right? Um, that's why it's science. Um, and so just the idea that, that I can have a set of ideas and ways that I want to take this and let's look at the possibilities, lay them out, but ultimately it has to go back on the student, right? Because, because they have to take ownership of the idea, right? Like I can't, you know, the mentor can't be the driving force behind everything, right? All you can do is try to facilitate that intrinsic motivation, support their basic needs and, and, and try to kind of just cultivate um, uh, an idea or a progression. Um, at least, you know, that's the way I see it. Hopefully it didn't come out too. <laughs> no, I, I, I like it. I mean, I think one of the things that I've found over the years, I've worked with a lot of students who started with a different uh, advisor, maybe, maybe not mentor, and who ended up working with me um, because of what we call sort of a, a fit. There was a fit somehow between that student and me. So how can a student... How can we best help students to, to know whether they're kind of in, you know, that they, they're in a mentoring relationship that works, that, that it, there's a fit for them in that relationship? You know, is there a way to kind of, um, you know, because well, I had a student at one point, a very, very good student, and, you know, for whatever reason, it wasn't a great fit, the two of our, of our working styles. She moved to a different mentor and went on to be very, very successful. You know, so some, it's not, you know, I think that, too often I've talked to both students and faculty, by the way, and other mentors that somehow you've got to make it work, you know, and that, 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 that it may not be. So I don't know if you've had that experience or you have any thoughts about, about that. I think that's tricky for people. Well, I mean, it can't be coerced, right? I think that's what you're getting at, right? And, and I think maybe, fortunately, kind of like the, the person you were involved with, you all at least discovered that it wasn't working, right? And moved on. It's a little painful. Um, it's a little more painful than I <laughs> Right. Well, I mean, relationships are messy, right? right? Um, but, but I mean, I think that, and Will kind of touched on it earlier. I mean, ultimately, it comes down to cultivating interpersonal trust, right? Like, you have to, that's what the, the basis of any real meaningful relationship, right? So, I mean, I think the whole idea that you need to be, everybody has to be real with everyone else, right? Like, you have to, we can't have some kind of facade um, you have to be, at least for me, I found just being direct with, with the mentee um, and, and 
telling them like you got to be direct with me as well right like it's a two-way street and when you when you have that kind of um context where it's more egalitarian and there's not a rigid hierarchy that it tends to uh, work better i think but yeah, we'll do that. that's also what i talk about too there is what i call the technical aspect of mentoring and but let's talk about the thing of like for example i'm reading about mentors and a lot of mentors it's interesting all they did was they inspired hope and belief in that and i think those people can can last you a lifetime right mm -hmm. uh, just having confidence in you at the same time there might be mentors who mentor you on some professional aspects mm -hmm. for example writing or research and things mm -hmm. um, and i found in my life for example i used i talked about my bio that i ended up not because I needed, I wanted to. I joined the army back in '88 as an officer to kind of a behavioral science officer, to kind of make ends meet. And I got involved with leadership. And all of a sudden, I needed some people to help me. To because what is leadership and what is what is organizational behavior like, and how do you manage all this? And so I found uh, Charlotte Miller, who is now a brigadier general and the first in the California National Guard female, uh, became one of my great mentors. Right and. I needed her because my academic friends couldn't help me, right? They were kind of like, <laughs> they couldn't help me. So sometimes, so I've, had, I've had several mentors, and sometimes you need somebody else. And by the way, this is going to happen at one point. You may go by your mentor, right? Not that you're, you're better than your mentor, but you might have a skill set or expertise. And I've seen this where my students have gone like, wow. You know, in fact, Charlotte probably knows so much more than I in so many different areas, right? You know, they don't know your PhD yet, but it's like, but by the way, that's a great thing when your students oh, yes. become better than you and yes. surpass you. And by the way, I've seen this happen where all of a sudden the mentor talks to a student, hey, can you help me with this? And that's <laughs> great. Where all of a sudden the mentee is now the expert. So anyway, so, so at some point, I think it'd be flexible. I think these, like all the personal mentoring is kind of, I think can be forever if they're the right group of character. But I think some of the other professional stuff, you're going to need people like you're doing the stuff for as a professional, as a leader, you're going to need a different kind of mentor than maybe somebody when you're undergraduate. Yeah, I, mean, I don't know if you talk to, talk to students about that issue at all. Yeah, I think um, my experience and the experience of um, some other students I've talked to here is that the best relationships with professors are with the professors who believe in you and um, respect you kind of in your own right for your own ideas. And it can be hard, especially as a first or second year student coming in to say, oh, there's so much I don't know. What do, what do I actually know? But, you know, there's experiences are, are so diverse and people's knowledge base can be grown so so quickly if you're interested in what you do and I think one of the things that's worked so well um, in the in my relationships with Robert and with Dr. Haas and with other great mentors I've had here is that um, you know they allow me from time to time to take on that expert role and it really helped build my confidence and so that's been one of the, the main things that I've appreciated yeah well, the um, actually the photo that we showed of the campus was taken by one of my mentees who was came to came to visit me this week. We've stayed in touch, even though she's now a full professor at uh, in a new university in New Jersey. But I think the reason I think what Will said is something to to think about too that these relationships evolve over time. So you know, at first they might really just be helping you to get your footing, to get confidence, and then as you develop your expertise what the relationship, the, the back and forth between the mentor and the mentee really evolves. Mm -hmm. And I think you can really, um, you know, you can grow together. And that's, to me, that's the best way. That's the best relationships when you're, you both feel like you're, you're moving forward because of the, because of the mentoring relationship. So I wanted to just, we're almost at, we're getting close to, to, um, to the end of this part of the session. Um, and I wanted to just see if any of you wanted to sort of add anything or to say, you know, is there something sort of final advice you might, you might give to our community about, about the value of mentoring or how to make sure you're getting what you need um, in, uh, in, in mentoring? He said, the frustrating part for me is I love all my students. I want to be the personal mentor, have coffee every day with everybody. But we have, we have, I think we figured this year all 353 students either coming, being here, or going. And it's so many. 
So one of my frustrating parts is, you know, I have to like trust other faculty, trust other students. Um, but we believe in it, it's a commitment. And the one thing would be, it doesn't matter if you're one of a, a larger group of people. It's, 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 it's really a priority. My priority is not to get the paper done in time unless she wants that. <laughs> but my priority is really the students, because I really do believe we will, we will change the world not by articles that's, that maybe sit in a journal and now in a dusty vault or even electronically not, but it's going to be the person who, who, who gets another heart, who believes in something, has a passion. Ultimately, it's going to take a person to do all of this. And I think uh, the ones listening, I see we have a large number. You're how the world will be changed. And that's why I'm committed. You're going to be doing the changing. And so and that's how I believe it's, it always happens. And I want to make it happen with you. Great. Wonderful. Well, it's hard to, it's hard to, follow, I was that. Say, hard to follow that. I agree. That might be the closing comment. Yeah. Yeah. Well, I think it's, if I had to say anything, I think it would be um, I just listen more than you speak um, if you're a mentor and, and don't presume that you know anything. Um, <laughs> but yeah, I, I think that's what I could leave you with. <laughs> that's great. Uh, from the student perspective and from the mentee perspective, I think. My closing words of advice uh, for someone who's looking to maybe start that type of relationship is to, to, come, um, to come prepared with uh, thoughts and ideas, but also with, with openness, because you never know um, what you might discover. Yeah. So I wanted to end by um, saying that last fall, we, uh, I, I initiated a new program here at, at Palo Alto University, uh, 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 PAU Unity Grants, and people were able to apply for funding. Um, over 90 some people uh, participated in one or another of the proposals that came in, and six projects were funded. Um, and, and a number of them actually touched on, on mentoring uh, in various ways. But what I've decided for uh, this coming year, for the next academic year, we will have a second round of PAU Unity Grant funding. But they will, um, I will be soliciting proposals for grants that have a theme uh, related to mentoring. So our second round of PAU Unity Grants will have a mentoring focus, and hopefully this panel, these wonderful people will have helped you. And if you have any further questions or want to talk more about mentoring, or uh, get more information, let us know, and we'd be happy to get that for you. So can we thank our panelists? And uh, we don't have an audience to clap, but I'll clap. Thank you. <laughs> thank you so much. We'll be back in a minute. All right. So thank you all for listening and sharing with us our discussion about mentoring. I, I see some wonderful comments and um, suggestions coming in, and I will definitely uh, review those and, and think about them, and perhaps they will help to guide the uh, solicitation for the PAU Unity Grants and for other programs that we might initiate here at, at PAU. As you can tell, this is something that's near and dear to my heart. Um, I have a chapter coming out on mentoring in the next few uh, weeks in a, in a wonderful uh, new book on women in leadership. So it's just something I'm both passionate about for in my own career and for the benefit of, of all of you. Um, so I wanted to spend some time now talking a little bit about my um, my first eight months here at PAU uh, to give you a little bit of a sense of what I've been what I've been doing, um, how I spend my time, and what I'm thinking about for us going forward. Um, you know, I have this vision. Um, I, I could tell when I when I interviewed for the position of president of this university, 
um, I could see that a tremendous foundation had been laid uh, here by President Emeritus Alan Cal Calvin and Provost Froming and the entire faculty. And so I knew that I was coming to a place that had a very strong foundation, this incredible student body and, and our wonderful alums uh, sprinkled throughout the, the world, really, the country and the world. Um, and I think that what I've really been trying to think about in these first months of my, of my work here is how to uh, create a bit more of a sense of a unified university. You know, I think that we have very strong programs here at PAU. Our doctoral program, uh, the PhD program, as well as the PsyD consortium with Stanford are top of the, top of the field. Our master's program, as you heard from Will and you know from, from others, is just really first rate. Um, in fact, we're the only accredited uh, program um, to provide online training in, uh, in, in counseling that west of the Rockies. So we, we really are at the cutting edge in that area. In our undergraduate program, I, I spent a day recently, an entire day, with three different cohorts of undergraduate students. And one more impressive than the next, you know, many of them have had big challenges to get to the point where they were ready to transfer into a, uh, their final two years of undergraduate work. And they made it, and they're here, and I think they're getting a terrific education um, so I'm very confident in the, in the academic programs that we offer. Of course, we always can make improvements. I'm always open for, for discussions uh, about that. But I think what's really challenging, and particularly because we have people in various parts of the country, we have people at different campuses, we are some people down at the wonderful Gronowski Clinic and, uh, and uh, at 5150 El Camino. So we really have to work hard to create the sense of community and the sense of a unified university. So these are the things that I've been really, really thinking about, and I'm very, very open for lots of ideas and conversations about that. I do believe, now, uh, I really and honestly believe I work a lot with people around the country. I'm very involved, as some of you know, in, in the American Psychological Association and other organizations. And I believe that we can be the best educational institution in the country that focuses on behavioral and mental health um, uh, and counseling and psychology. Um, I have no doubt about that. But we need to be, be able to do it as a unified uh, community. So one of the things that I'm doing to try to build toward that is we've initiated a new strategic planning process. Uh, I know it sounds a little dry, like, oh, strategic planning, everybody, um, everybody says those words, but I take them really seriously. I'm very, very committed to a, what some people might call sort of bottoms up strategic planning process. That is, I want to hear from the entire community about your vision for the school. Um, you know, I have uh, my own vision, as I said. I think we can be the best institution of our kind, uh, and I have some thoughts about how to get there. But without the commitment of our students, our faculty, our alum, our board of trustees, our whole community, um, we won't get there. That, that it, just, it just doesn't work. So to get us to the next level of achievement, I've initiated a, a, a process that I hope everybody will become engaged with. Um, we will start by having a series of focus groups, so small groups um, that will allow for, well, it's not small, 12 to 15 people per group in various areas. So in, in faculty, with students, with alums, with, with staff, administrative um, personnel, and also including community partners. And with, with those focus groups, we will really tackle some difficult questions. You know, what is the future of this institution? And sort of thinking about where we fit, what are the barriers that, that are preventing us from, from achieving our goals, and what are the things that are helping us to achieve our goals? So really, really explicitly identifying those things. Community engagement in this process is crucial. So the questions, once they're developed and, and uh, laid out for the focus groups, will also be available to the entire community. And everybody will have the opportunity to provide us with input on those big questions. Um, 
we will soon send out information about this effort and about the kind of the way to get involved in all of the logistics of that. So please, please look for that. Um, we're also going to include focused discussions with a number of our community partners. So just this week, um, I've met with, with several key uh, behavioral health and county government, uh, you know, chambers of commerce, I mean, all kinds of people in the community who, in one way or another, actually influence the context in which we work. So if we want to have uh, well-supported mental health counseling centers and community-based interventions for all of the areas that we're interested in, um, we need to be partners with those, with those folks. And what I, the, the amazing thing I hear from all of them, in really every single place where I've, where I've gone to meet, is how unbelievably qualified our students are, how well-trained they are, how if they have a choice between a PAU student and a student from somewhere else, they take the PAU student, and that is really makes me exceedingly happy, and I'm so proud of that. But we also need to know what their needs are and how, and there may be areas, for example, where they need more help, and we could be providing that by expanding our programs in carefully chosen ways. So we will include focused discussions with key community partners and Silicon Valley leaders um, so that our visioning and planning takes those things into account. The Board of Trustees will be very involved in this process. Um, once we have held the focus group, solicited input, talked to all of, the, all of you in some way or another, we will pull together a, um, a set of uh, recommendations and, and plans going forward, and the Board of Trustees will dedicate an entire day of retreat to discussing those, uh, those things. So they will have a lot of input as well, and I think it, it's the strength of a university is when all participants at all levels of the, uh, of, the, of the institution are engaged, and we are very fortunate to have a very engaged Board of Trustees, so I'm absolutely delighted about that. Um, once uh, that has happened, there will be a, um, a strategic planning document um, developed, and that will be made available for the entire community. There will be a, a portal or some, uh, some um, uh, access point where everybody will be able to uh, read and review the document and, and provide uh, comments and, and suggestions for it. Uh, if all goes as planned, the strategic plan uh, we'll go to the Board of Trustees for approval in September, and we will then have a vision and guidepost statement that will help us to make sort of evidence-based important decisions about, about our future development. So I'm very, very excited about this process. It's really important to our, to our future to have clear guideposts, to sort of know where we're heading. Um, and as I say, we're building on a tremendous foundation but I know we can achieve even uh, greater uh, aims. So I'm, I'm very excited and encourage all of you to become involved. Um, I also wanted to mention that on Monday, actually, we will uh, be launching um, advertisement for our new Director of Student Services. So this is a very important uh, position. We have, of course, had a wonderful service from Vice President uh, Liz Hilt for many, many years, who retired recently. So in, in working to replace um, that position, we're really looking for somebody who can think very, very expansively about student services. And some of the questions that are coming in about how to, how to engage with online um, communities in particular and, and with the challenging geography that, that we have, we really will be looking for someone in that position who can who can think about those issues creatively, who maybe who has had to deal with some of those issues in prior positions, and who has a lot of uh, experience working with students at all levels. So this is a very exciting time. Um, student councils, as well as faculty and and administrators, have had uh, have had input into the job description itself. It will be posted on our website. Um, so you can see the type of person that we're looking for and the type of, um, of, of expansive um, uh, expertise and qualities that we're, that we're hoping to find in that, in that um, 
person. And once uh, that uh, position is filled, we will then really do a careful review of our of the way that we provide service to, uh, to students. And I think we do a very good job in a number of important areas, but I'm just one of these people who thinks we can always do better. So, so we're, we will, we will, um, we will look for ways to provide uh, even even better support than we do now to our students at all levels. So again, if you have uh, input or questions or comments about that, please please let me know. Um, another thing that is challenging for us in um, in creating a unified university is the way that we communicate with you. So we are trying to. Uh, cut back a little bit on the number of emails <laughs> that go out that so we're trying to think of effective ways to communicate. Obviously, this Zoom town hall is, is one of those uh, approaches that we're taking. So we're very open for ideas about how best to communicate with you, um, how, how often you'd like to hear from, from my office, from other offices at the university. Um, how easy you find it to ex access information that you need. Um, we're really interested in improving the communications across the university. So that's, um, that's another important area for us. Um, wanted to also mention that we are, in addition to the strategic planning process, we are also in the middle of our regional accreditation um, process, which is something all universities have to go through. And uh, that will take place during the next academic year. And many of you will have the opportunity to participate in that process as well. Um, so I just wanted to alert you when you hear about it, that's, um, that's what we're doing. Um, and it's very, very important, obviously, that we, that we, um, that we engage in that process very thoughtfully. Uh, Dean Jim Breckenridge is, is, is helping me with that, um, with that process. And something else that we've done that I think is a very, very uh, good development is that we have uh, revamped our institutional research office in the time that I've been here. We now have uh, two very, very talented people working on our data. So now that we, we can now provide better information about our students, about our outcomes, and about what, what we're doing. So I think that's, that's something that we're very, very proud of. I wanted to come back to the idea of community engagement to, to give you a sense of, of how I, partly how I spend my time. Um, I am, you know, one of the questions that's come in, uh, and this actually fits right in, I'm seeing, um, this question, which is, what was my, what was the biggest surprise that I, um, that I've, that I've had since I've arrived here at Palo Alto University? And I think the the biggest surprise for me has been the sort of disconnect between the quality of what I'm seeing with the faculty and the students and our academic programs and our reputation in certain, um, certain areas and how too many people are not aware of what we're doing here at Palo Alto University. So when I meet with, I've been meeting with community um, partners all throughout Silicon Valley and San Francisco and um, around the country, frankly, and I'm surprised that more people aren't aware of the amazing work that we're doing here. So I take it as one of my main tasks as your president to make sure that the community knows um, who, what, who we are, what we're doing, the amazing accomplishments of our alumni and our students and our faculty, and to, when there's a conversation about quality training and education in psychology and counseling and behavioral health, that Palo Alto University is in that conversation. So that I take as a, one of my primary commitments to you as, as president. And when I'm meeting with, just in the last few weeks, I've met with PAU uh, Rotary Clubs, with the Chambers of Commerce, with the Silicon Valley Community Foundation, Silicon Valley Leadership Group, the Community Health Awareness Council, El Camino Hospital, the, uh, Life Moves, Catholic Charities, Israel I mean, many, many organizations. And I'm trying to make sure, as best I can, and with your help, and with your fa the faculty and student and alumni help, to make sure that people are aware of all of the wonderful things we are doing here. We have faculty doing cutting edge research in diversity, in public health, in suicide 
and suicidality and LGBTQ uh, issues in all kinds of areas that really almost no one else is doing. And so we, we are, or we're certainly doing it as well as anyone else is doing it. Let me put it that way. Uh, so I think it's really important for us to take every opportunity to brag about what we're doing here at PAU, to make sure people know when you have a chance to, when you're talking with others, make sure they know you're from Palo Alto University. Um, you know, I'm looking forward to going up to Seattle the end of this coming week for the American Psychology Law Society meetings. Um, and Chris Weaver, Dr. Chris Weaver and Dr. Amanda Faneff and their students uh, will be there presenting. And two of our students received highly prestigious um, diversity enhancement awards for their travel to the conference. These are exceedingly competitive awards. I've, I've served on the committee over the years for these awards, so I'm very aware of how competitive they are. So that it is just an amazing accomplishment in our, this was in our forensic area in the PhD program, but there are many areas where we have these types of accomplishments. So if you have an accomplishment, an achievement, you win an award, you have a grant, you want to talk about any of these areas, please let us know so that we can brag about you to, to the rest of the, the community. Uh, take that as one of my main jobs here at PAU. I wanted to also talk about uh, teaching. So I, I'm a huge uh, uh, fanatic for mentoring, as you can probably tell, but I am equally committed to high quality instruction in the classroom. Um, so when I, some of you may know that when I was at the Graduate Center at City University of New York, I helped to develop a very uh, in-depth pedagogy program for our graduate students there. Um, graduate students at uh, City University teach in the undergraduate classrooms at CUNY. And I think we have many doctoral students here at PAU and, and master students who have the capacity to be great instructors in the classroom. So we're working very hard. Um, Crystal Nazal and a number of other faculty are meeting and developing professional development for improving the techniques in the classroom. And this summer we'll be having a, our first uh, conference that was funded by a PAU Unity grant but it will be a conference dedicated to pedagogy and to cutting edge teaching techniques. So I think this is one, another way that we can really um, stand out in the crowd. We have uh, people who are very dedicated to teaching, but we as the sort of the administration and the supporting organization can provide more resources and, uh, and professional development in, in teaching. So that is another one of my, of my main commitments. So I think I'm going to see if there are any questions that are up here so I can see. Um, uh, not, we have, well, here's a question. Well, there's a, there are a lot of questions about online. I can see the people who are, who are remote. We would call you your, your remote students who are not physically here. And this is one of the only ways really to connect with you. So we may need to uh, develop a focus group around or, you know, really, really think with, with Dr. Snow and with others about how to enhance your engagement um, with the community. We feel very much that you're a part of our, of our community, uh, but we just don't get to see you physically. <laughs> so we can see you on the screen and we want to hear, uh, we want to hear your tips. So, um, so we will continue to work on that. Uh, we believe in this technology. And, you know, I was talking to some colleagues recently about the way that online education has evolved. And in, in a number of institutions, it is still very much a, a, an enterprise where content is put online, students read it, and then they interact with discussion board kind of interaction, but they don't have the type of face-to-face -face interaction that we have in our master's program. So expanding that type of at least visual contact, virtual classroom that we use with our Zoom technology um, is something we really want to do, uh, particularly in, we can move into the undergraduate area and even in the doctoral area. So I think that's something to really, uh, that, that we really wanna think about in terms of um, 
in terms of uh, in, in increasing the, the, the strength of our community. I see there's also a question about how to expand opportunities for master's students to do practica training here at PAU. So many of you know probably that we have a, 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 a very strong training clinic called the Granowski Center, which is at 5150 El Camino Real. And the um, training co uh, clinic was set up to support first the doctoral, the PhD students, and then uh, some also some of the PsyD students. Um, but there, you know, one of the questions is how could we have opportunities like that for students at the master's level? Um, one of the meetings that Dr. Snow and I have had in the last few weeks um, with Dr. Baina as well is with one organization in town that is that that does um, can rely on master's level counseling uh, uh, professionals. So we are, and, so, and we've had a beginning of a conversation with how we might expand those opportunities. So it's definitely something that has come up. I think it's a really important um, point. Um, I know our students are highly valued. I can tell you everywhere that I've met where our master's students are, 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 are attaining their practica hours, uh, we get rave reviews about you, um, but it is a challenge because you're always having to find those opportunities. So it is something that we can think about um, uh, working working on. Um, and there's also a question I see about um, including remote faculty in, in our focus groups. Absolutely. We are going to make the Zoom technology available for those focus groups. So. Uh, we will think of ways uh, to do that um, uh, for sure. So, so keep keep an eye on that. Um, um, I have a question from uh, from someone about whether we're going with the strategic plan. We would be in um, developing new programs. I am absolutely open to that idea. Uh, I don't have you know we don't have any um, specific. Um, uh, well, there's some there's some obvious. Uh, you know expansions that are that that make sense given where we are um but but there may be others that we haven't even thought about so we will as definitely as part of the strategic planning process one of the key questions that we will tackle is is you know whether we wh what are the areas that hold tremendous promise for for expansion um of you know, again, we have these challenges, geographic challenges. How do we make something work um, given our, um, our our limitations on space and other kinds of things? But the discussions will focus on substantively what is it that we think we could do well. You know, we're not going to expand. I think I think there's sometimes in universities and institutions there's there's an effort to expand um, just for the sake of expansion. <laughs> I'm not uh, I'm not so interested in that, but I'm very interested in expanding in areas where we can be excellent. So, um, you know, that some areas we may have existing expertise and we just simply aren't, um, we aren't shining a light on that in to the world. In other areas, we might actually need to build expertise to, on top of what we already have. So I think there's a lot we can do, but that is definitely part of the strategic planning um, process. Um, another question that has come in that I want to emphasize because it, it flows right out of our PAU Unity grant process. So one of the grants that was funded was for a Latinx task force. Uh, over 30 people came together to propose a, the creation of a tax task force to focus on supporting and expanding our services and opportunities for Latino Latina students and faculty and staff. Uh, it was a beautiful proposal. I was delighted to be able to provide support for it. And that group has already started meeting. And I think the um, there's an amazing statistic. I'm going to credit um, our, our uh, self-study process and our institutional research uh, team, including Jim uh, Breckenridge and Kristen Guy, for helping me to, to, to understand this number. But if we were to graduate everyone who's in the pipeline now, um, we, are, we actually have the opportunity 
to graduate 5% of all Latino Latina psychologists who will graduate this coming year in the country. So one small little place will graduate 5% of those um, new professionals. Now, there's a, there's a downside to that, which is that there are way too many places in the country that are, that are not adequately providing um, training to that important uh, population. We are absolutely committed to being one of the leading uh, training sites for uh, Latina, Latino students and faculty in, in all, at all levels. So you may know, but you might not, that at the Gronowski Center, we have a Clinica Latina where the doctoral students are being trained in Spanish to do Spanish language therapy. This is a tremendous need in the community. When, when I'm talking to partners out in the community, this is something that is mentioned over and over again. The number of, um, of people they cannot serve because they cannot provide uh, language specific um, services, not just in Spanish, uh, but also in Mandarin and, and other languages as well. But we are doing wonderful work to train people in Spanish language. So this is an area of, of a very big priority for us. I think we can make a big difference, not just here in the community, but really in our entire profession by the work that we're doing. Um, we have a large proportion of our undergraduate students uh, are, are uh, Latino Latina students, and it's it's a really important um, for us that we create that pipeline so that those undergraduate students can go on to graduate school and on to professional training in this area, so that we can better serve the community. So it's a really important area, and I I appreciate someone uh, bringing it up. Uh, another question that has come up is about. Um, uh, additional trainings that we could provide in sort of specialized areas. So this is something, one of the other areas that I wanted to talk about and that will be discussed greatly in the strategic planning process. So we have tremendous potential to provide additional community-based, uh, community-offered continuing education programs. So we have um, people with particular expertises in, in mindfulness, uh, of course, Dr. Waldy, we have people with expertise in LGBTQ, in, uh, um, in other areas uh, that, that the community, when they, when licensed professionals went through their training years ago, may not have had access to those uh, specialty areas that we can now provide. So I think one of the things we need to think about is how PAU could become a center for excellence in professional studies in our field. What that would do if we could build that capacity is that we could then invite students to participate in those sessions. So uh, they would be designed for the licensed professionals and to, to meet continuing education needs, but our students could become involved, could, they could help out uh, in, in putting those on, they could then get the benefit of those specialty areas. And if there are areas, uh, one, one commenter here mentioned uh, art therapy um, type, uh, you know, there are, there, there's a wonderful art therapy program at Notre Dame de Namur, which is just down the street. So in, a, in an area like that, we could partner with, with them to bring that to us rather than us trying to do something that we don't have the expertise to do. So I think there, the, the, this is partly why these community partnerships are, are so important. Um, so that's a really exciting opportunity. I mean, there's so many areas where we, we could be providing um, specialized service. You know, a number of the faculty are very involved with their students in um, suicide prevention and working in this important area in this community, which has really had a big challenge, particularly in, in adolescent um, therapy and adolescent suicide, this is an area where we could be providing some real specialized training for the more, you know, for the, for the professional who may not have that type of training and who could really benefit from this cutting edge uh, work. So I think that that's an example of something where, you know, we may take for granted that we do this because we have these amazing people like Joyce Chu and, and, and others who do this work, Bruce Bonder and 
and Lisa Brown and, and the trauma area, so many people with tremendous expertise that we could bring this to the community and then also in the same way benefit our students. So that's really something that I hope the strategic planning process will, will see as a viable path forward and it certainly is one that I'm, I'm uh, in, very, very interested in. Um, um, I see a question about, I'm looking at the questions here. There seems to be one about um, the community differentiating between, oh, I see this very interesting question about differentiating between for-profit institutions and not-for-profit institutions, which is of course what PAU is. And I think the, the, uh, the questioner is absolutely right that the general public um, sometimes doesn't understand the importance of that difference. And uh, there is at least some uh, suspicion now that the, uh, some of the uh, restrictions that had been, or, or, or uh, I don't know, restrictions or um, imposed uh, standards that had been put in place by President Obama's uh, Department of Education might now not be um, followed through in terms of the for-profit uh, industry. So I think it is really important for us, for, the, for us to help the community understand what it is that not-for-profit education is about. You know, we are not here to make money. We are here to serve our students and to serve the community. Um, you know, this is why we have not-for-profit status. This is why we, um, you know, this is why most of us are here. So I think you're right, though, that the public doesn't necessarily understand, and more importantly, the, the, um, the students who sometimes get caught up in thinking that they see the name of a, of a, of a place uh, frequently because the, uh, uh, some place might advertise on, in, in, you know, in a way that they're, they're used to seeing the name, but they don't know how to ask the questions about educational effectiveness and the outcomes. And I think what we can demonstrate with our data is very, very uh, important outcomes. Um, it would be unlikely for a for-profit institution to have a 95% um, accreditation, uh, APA accredited in internship rate, for example. I mean, that's just one number, but it's an important one. And to have an 82% graduation rate for our undergraduates. So I think these are important ways that we need to communicate what we're doing, where we're putting our resources to make sure we're achieving those educational outcomes, as opposed to putting resources into profit making. Uh, that is not what we do. All of our money goes into figuring out ways to better support the institution. And that's, that's what our commitment is, and that's what we um, what we're here to here to do. Um, so I'm. I think we're. I'm. I think we may be drawing to a close here, and I, I think we've. I've been able to answer most of the questions that have that have come in, um, and I don't want to take more of your time than is than is necessary. So I think I would just like to close by saying, you know, if you found this helpful, if you um, would like to have more of these sorts of opportunities to, to talk with me and with others. Um, I want to again thank um, Will and Robert and Charlotte for taking their time to uh, talk with us about mentoring, which again I, is, a, uh, is such an important topic for us. Um, but if you're interested in having more of these opportunities, please let me know. Uh, I hope you all know my how to reach me at moconnor at paloaltou.edu. Um, that is, uh, uh, you will, I, and I think you will get an email um, after this event to show you how uh, how you can obtain a copy or to or to to view it in the future. Um, I want to thank Dave Levitt, who's been here with me to try to, to uh, manage the technology piece of this, and Rhonda Hayes, who's been here to support, to support the process, uh, and to thank all, of, mostly to thank all of you for taking time on your Sunday night, um, right after bracketology. I don't know if any of you are basketball fans, but hopefully, hopefully we didn't cut into your, uh, to your basketball uh, watching. Uh, but but thank you for joining me tonight and for for listening and uh, and sending in your questions and comments um, 
and please, you know, let me know if you'd like more like this, and I'd be happy to, uh, to, to do that. All right. Have a wonderful evening and a great week. Thanks so much.